Right, family, we're going to get into uh, the presentation. And just to let you know that if you, if you are not already aware that Brother Robin Walker is the author of the most comprehensive text giving you a broad overview of African history uh, from ancient times uh, right up until present day family, yeah? Um, and so his seminal work, yeah, is When We Rule, which is currently in its second edition. He is also the author of a number of other titles, which I won't all the way go all the way through today, except to say that Brother Robin is the most published black author uh, on African black history in the 21st century. This is bar none, yeah? You know what I'm saying? So we are, uh, you know, dutifully in the presence of a dutiful scholar, uh, a purposeful scholar, and an illustrious one at that. And so with that, brothers and sisters, I know you never come to hear me, so I'm going to hand over to Brother Robin Walker to take us forward with uh, the Queens of the Nile and the Niger regions. Go ahead, Brother Robin. All right, greetings, everybody. All right, let me get straight into it. The presentation is called Queens of the Nile and the Niger Regions. The presentation might take two hours or less. Hopefully, I'll keep it as short as I can. Um, today's date, Sunday, the 29th of March, 2020. All right, let me get straight into it. Um, the presentation is three themes, ancient Egypt, ancient Sudan, and ancient Nigeria. And the very first theme is the Nile Valley. Um, we're gonna be dealing with ancient Egypt, uh, mostly from 5,600 and something BC to around 1,000 BC. Ancient Egypt, you can see the map where you have certain key cities like Thebes, Karnak, the capital city, Memphis. Another great city is Giza, that's where the pyramids are. And these are the settings for what I'm about to get straight into. Now, one question that comes up is what has ancient Egypt to do with Africa and its history? Well, this is uh, the mummy of Queen Tia. And can you see that is clearly uh, a woman of African heritage. Here we have the mummy of Mariette Amun. And can you see the plaits? That's the kind of thing you'll see in Peckham on a Saturday afternoon being put in. All right, the Daily Mail did an article called Cancer is Purely Man-Made. Uh, almost no trace of disease in Egyptian mummies. And this was published the 15th of October, 2010. And the article was by Fiona McRae. And to illustrate the article, they had this mummy. Um, hope you all can see that. Hope you're all enjoying that picture right there. There's one of your ancient Nile Valley ancestors. I'm going to tell you who she is later on in the session. All right. Now, when we divide Egyptian history up, we divide it into the rise and fall of dynasties. And ultimately, there were 33 ruling dynasties. And the very first family to rule is what we call the first dynasty. And Egypt's first female ruler was Queen Neith Hotep. And she reigned somewhere around 5581 BC. She ruled as queen regent for Pharaoh Jair until he became of age to accept full political authority. Queen regent means you're ruling on behalf of a king because the king is too young to take power, too ill to take power, that kind of thing. So she's running the country, but her role is regent. Now, what was going on in the world at this time? Absolutely nothing. If you were to look at the world in the sixth millennium BC, there was civilization in Nubia, there was civilization in Kemet, there were no civilizations anywhere else on the planet. Um, nothing had happened. So your Romulus and Remus are uh, feeding off the she-wolf in Rome, that hadn't happened yet. Uh, Jason and the Argonauts with the Greeks, that hadn't happened yet. The Sumerians, they didn't exist yet. 
So you had people all over the world, but none of them had built a civilization other than what was going on in Nubia and what was going on in Kemet. Now, let me show you this picture and let me read the caption. The, the large first dynasty tomb at Abydos, first excavated by De Morgan and ascribed by him to Nameh was subsequently re-excavated by Petrie, who concluded that it was, in fact, the tomb of his queen, Neith Hotep. Now, Neith Hotep's tomb, if we look at that structure, it looks exactly like a pre-dynastic um, structure in Sumer called Eridu Temple 7. Now, the significance of that is this. Eridu Temple 7, um, is pre the period where the Sumerians of Iraq have kings. But this is the same period where Egypt is on its first dynasty. And so here we have proof then that the first dynasty period of Egypt coincides with the pre, 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 pre-dynastic period of Sumer because their Eridu Temple 7 looks exactly like that and is probably a copy of that. So who else ruled from this dynasty? Pharaoh Merneith succeeded Jair on the throne and became Egypt's first female pharaoh, ruling as head of state, not ruling because she's the wife of the king or the mother of the next king, ruling as absolute pharaoh, absolute head of state. And her time period is roughly 5524 to 5507 BC. Her name means beloved of Neith. So she's named after the same goddess, the goddess Neith, that the Greeks, when they came on the scene, would later turn into their goddess Athena. And the importance of this is the gods of Mount Olympus that the Greeks venerated are really African deities that they've simply given Greek names. And so Neith becomes Athena, and we can continue. Amen becomes Zeus, we could continue. Um, Isis becomes Ceres, we could continue. Hathor becomes Aphrodite, and we can go down the whole list. Now, Neith had two great tombs built, one in the southern city of Abydos, the other in the northern city of Saqqara. And why you would have these tombs built is it symbolizes her authority as the ruler of the north and the south, lower and upper Egypt. And at this time, um, governments in the world, and there's only two, Egypt and Nubia, they were not concerned with doing what governments do today, building useful things for the people. They were building things for religious significance and religion came first. The idea of building things of a utilitarian nation, nature for the general public, that hadn't really arrived in the world yet. Now her monuments were just as large and just as impressive as those of the male pharaohs, showing that there's no loss of status to her being female and ruling. So what was the Egyptian Old Kingdom period? Queen Regent Nethotep and Pharaoh Merneith belonged to the first Egyptian dynasty. And dynasty one to the end of dynasty six, which is 1,472 years, an enormous time period, this was Egypt's first golden age. And this takes us from 5660 to 4188 BC. This was the era when the solar calendar was invented. This was the era where the great Sphinx of Giza was built. This was the era where the great pyramids were erected. And this was the era where the first substantial literature in the world appeared. And this is your religious literature and your philosophical literature. All right, so do we have images of women from this period? Well, one of them is Kera Duwank, and she's the mother of Imhotep. And I have to big up um, Dr. Runoka Rashidi, who found this sculpture 
and our, our in other words, he that wasn't the one that discovered it, but he was the one that let the rest of us um, in the black scholarly world know that this image existed. He took the photograph and he put that inserted image of a modern woman from Ethiopia. So you can see that the hairstyle that she has is the same as what Kara Duank was rocking uh, 7,000 years ago. Now, what does this fourth dynasty image tell us? This is Pharaoh Menkara and Queen Kar Meren, excuse me, Kar Merenebti. And you can see that there's an attitude of love. There's an attitude that they're the same size. There's uh, an embrace. And this is not how most of the ancient world represents men and women. And this is a powerful thing to know. The idea that they're the same size, they're presented in the same kind of attitude, and then there's the subtle embrace. Um, it shows a, a, an equality, a mutual respect that you don't often see in the ancient world like that. Queen Heteferes was a, a queen at the height of the Pyramid Age. Heteferes is the name that scholars now think is the correct name, but scholars like Chancellor Williams presents this same woman as Mertitefs, and the term Mertitef doesn't usually appear in the literature. So we think Hetaferes is the real name, and Mertitefs is what scholars used to think. And at her time period, Fourth Dynasty, Egypt was at the height of its population, the height of its wealth. Egypt in the Fourth Dynasty was as urbanized as European countries are today. And I mean that with a perfectly straight face. Egypt had a population of 8 million people crowded into an area of 11,500 square miles. That's uh, about the same area as Belgium. And it had a population comparable. Therefore, it was as urbanized. And during this prosperity, Queen Hetaferes or Mertitefs or whatever her name is, her furniture has been discovered. And as you can see, it's pretty grand, it's pretty impressive. Golden encased chair, golden encased bed, the golden headrest and the other decorations. This is how she was buried. And that wouldn't look out of place um, during the Art Deco period of the early 1920s. Now, another princess exists from the uh, Fourth Dynasty period whose sculpture survived. And again, I have to thank uh, Dr. Rashidi, who found this uh, image. Uh, took the photograph, and here it is. This is one of the burials uh, during the Giza period. Uh, she's a princess. We don't know what her name is, but she's obviously a member of the royal family from the Fourth Dynasty. So who were the other early queens? Two great females appeared during the Sixth Dynasty. Iput who ruled Egypt as queen regent for Pharaoh Pepi I until he became of age. She ruled somewhere around 4355 BC. And Pharaoh Nitocris, um, the African version of her name is Nitokerti. She was the last ruler of the dynasty and she ruled for 12 years, 4200 to 4188 BC. The last of 50 pharaohs of the old kingdom period. Some later traditions claim that she is the one responsible for commissioning the third great pyramid of Giza, but this tradition is probably false. Um, the old kingdom did collapse after her rule. Um, so 50 pharaohs, 5660 to 4188 BC, 1,472 years of African glory, I mean, I've just explained it to you in a few minutes, but that's 1,472 years. That's like a dynasty being in power 
500 AD, and they're still in power today. That's about the same kind of time period. So Egypt went into a 700 year decline after this called the first intermediate period, 4188 to 3448 BC. During this decline, we get invasions coming in from the Middle East, uh, barbarians causing all kinds of problems in Egypt. And Egypt took 700 years to sort the problems out. Meanwhile, Kush, the land to the south of Egypt, became a great and powerful kingdom during this period, taking over from the earlier uh, kingdom of Tarseti that had ruled in the south. So what was the next golden age? Egypt entered its second golden age called the Middle Kingdom period in 3448 BC. The Egyptians now had evolved to the cultural level that they did what governments to, uh, today do. It was no longer about building grand monuments uh, that reached to the sky. It wasn't about um, building for religious purposes. Now it was building for utilitarian purposes. So the Egyptian government during the Middle Kingdom was doing exactly what modern governments do today. They built things like planned cities. They built structures with apartment blocks. And so the, the very first planned city in the world emerged during this period, the city of Kahu. It's laid out on a horizontal vertical grid and it had mansions of 70 rooms. Also, the Egyptians built the largest single monument in the ancient world called the Labyrinth, with its 3,000 apartments, uh, 12 palaces, and so on. Scholars are not sure of what it is, but in my opinion, it's a hotel complex. And finally, the Egyptians colonized Kush during this period. Another thing that happens is civilizations appeared for the first time in Asia, particularly South Asia or Western Asia, some people call it, the Middle East. And among these civilizations were Sumer, located in modern Iraq, emerging 3300 BC, Elam in modern Iran, Akkad in modern Iraq and Syria, and then the Indus Valley are in Western India and Pakistan. And with the controversial exception of Crete, there were no other civilizations on the planet at this date. By the way, it needs to be pointed out though that Sumer, Elam, Akkad, and the Indus Valley civilizations were also black. The populations of those countries were what scholars today call Negroes and Australoids. And so those were all black civilizations. Now, even Crete, there's a huge question mark over who they were, because there's no evidence that the Cretans were Europeans, despite Crete being in Europe. And some historians claim that Stonehenge and various other structures built in Ireland and Northern Scotland deserve consideration uh, uh, for civilization in Europe, but again, there's no evidence that Europeans, as we understand them today, had anything to do with any of those. And I might refer you to um, a short program that I did with the uh, Got Kush Posse, uh, where we go in on Stonehenge and that kind of thing. All right, so who were the Egyptian queens during this period? Well, there was Queen Ashait. And this is again, a photograph taken by the great Dr. Uh, Rashidi. Uh, people feeling that, now you can see that she's got some blue hair dye or something like that. And the blue does represent a uh, divinity in this particular context. Um, Queen Kawit, um, you can see she's getting her hair done. And that's the kind of scene you'll see in Peckham, um, Saturday afternoon, uh, that kind of scene. So I mentioned some of these places are Phoenicia, Arabia Felix, Sumer, Elam, Indus Valley. Sumer, you can see where the arrow is. 
That is uh, the third civilization to exist on the planet. The Nubian kingdom of Tarseti is the first. The ancient Egyptian civilization of Kemet is second. The Sumerians are third. And then after that, we get civilization in Elam, the Indus Valley, etc., etc. And these are, as I said, black civilizations. So what do we know about Sumer? Well, the jewelry of Chieftess Puabi, who is one of the Sumerian rulers, she ruled around 3200 BC. And she's the earliest great Sumerian woman, was impressive and comparable in style with 12th dynasty Egypt. And the significance of that, again, is pre-dynastic Sumer is the same time period as dynastic Egypt. So we can match off Puabi against the 12th dynasty. Another important Sumerian ruler <clears throat> was Kubaba, and she belonged to what's called the third dynasty of Kish. Now, there's an important Sumerian cylinder called the King's List, and her name is inscribed on it, and the King's List also calls her the barmaid. Now, what does this term barmaid mean? Some people think she was originally the owner of a tavern or perhaps the owner of a vineyard before becoming NC. NC means king. And so she ruled with exactly the same authority that the male heads of state ruled. Um, now, we don't really know very much about her, but there is a late um, tradition that claims that her armies seized Kish from the city of Akshak. And she is said to have consolidated the foundation of Kish and to have ruled 100 years. Was she really on the throne for 100 years? Is this really facts or is this legend? We don't really know. But scholars think that she must have ruled in Sumer at some period before 2508 BC. So what was happening in Egypt? The last pharaoh of the Middle Kingdom was Sebek Neferura, and she ruled Egypt for an ephemeral three years and 10 months, 3186 to 3182 BC. After her reign, the Middle Kingdom of Egypt collapsed, and Egypt entered her second dark age, the second intermediate period. And this was 1,400 plus years of anarchy. This takes us from 3182 BC until 1709 BC. During this lengthy period, Caucasian invaders from Asia ruled in Egypt. These were the first Caucasians known to have ruled any part of African territory. And they ruled as Egyptian dynasty 14. They were later joined by a second Asian horde, known as the Hyksos, who ruled from 2545 until 1709 BC. Um, meanwhile, Kush, again, to the south, flourished while Egypt was getting its butt handed back to it. So how were the foreigners removed from power? Well, during the reign of the last Hyksos ruler, the Egyptians rebelled led by the indigenous monarchs of the 17th ruling dynasty. Queen Ahotep was renowned for saving Egypt during these wars of liberation against the Hyksos. She rallied the Egyptian troops and crushed a rebellion in Upper Egypt. For her part in the liberation struggle, she received Egypt's highest military order at least three times, the Order of the Fly. Let me say something about that. When archaeologists discovered the artifacts from the oldest period of Nubia, where Nubia had the world's first kingdom, the kingdom of Tarseti, they found um, prototypes of, of jewelry that looks just like the Order of the Fly. And so I speculate then that the Order of the Fly is a, a, a military decoration that had its origins in the Nubian kingdom of Tarseti. 
After ruling as queen regent, Carmos, her son succeeded her. He maintained the military pressure on the Hyksos until they were finally evicted from Egypt. So who were the queens of the new golden age? Well, the 18th dynasty is the most celebrated period of ancient Egyptian history to date. It's celebrated because Europeans love that period for some reason. And part of the reason why they love the period is because some of the population of Egypt now contained a significant proportion of non-Africans um, who had got there during the Asian occupation and the Hyksos occupation. Whichever be the case, the Africans were back and we get the New Kingdom period, dynasties 18, 19 and 20, which is 1709 to 1095 BC. This is our 31 rulers ruling over 614 years. Now, what was going on in the rest of the world at this time? Well, we're now going to start to see civilization all over Asia. We're starting to see now the rise of civilization in the Americas, the Americas, places like the Olmec period, um, but there's still nothing going on in Europe, uh, nothing worth wasting any breath over uh, during this period. So it's now uh, Africa, Asia, the Americas. Pharaoh Amos founded the 18th ruling dynasty. Uh, Amos Nefertari was his wife. And she high, was highly distinguished and did much to help reconstruct the country, uh, holding the position of the second prophet of Amen and that of divine wife. And this is the kind of typical art uh, presentation of Queen Amos Nefertari. So are there other images of her? This is uh, an exquisite uh, sculpture. And Rashidi uh, took this close up, and I think people are enjoying that. There's other images too. So, what did she do? In these duties, she performed various civil and religious actions. She maintained a college of priestesses. She controlled the divine offerings to the deity Amen and was in charge of the workers of the temple fields and controlled a number of dignitaries. You see, at this period, Egypt, having been under foreign rule without, for over a thousand years, had to reconstruct, had to rebuild. They had to gather expertise to create a, a, a rebirth of knowledge, knowledge that had largely disappeared um, over the thousand year period. Um, Amos Nefertari later ruled as queen regent for Amenhotep I, who was her son. Some building projects date back to her time, such as the reconstruction of the Deir el Medina necropolis. And England's greatest archaeologist, Sir Flinders Petrie, says she is the most venerated figure of Egyptian history. Now, let that sink in the most venerated figure of Egyptian history. Now, when people talk about Egypt today, they ignore her. Uh, so one of the issues that our community needs to address is colorism. And perhaps if images like this, images like this, images like this are, became are, are widely known images, perhaps we could address some of the issues to do with colorism. So who came next? This is Hatshepsut, and she's the next great woman of the dynasty. In September 1650 BC, Thotmose I, who was her father, elevated her to the position of co-regent, meaning her job was to rule the country alongside him. Following this, in 1628 BC, she became the great royal wife of Thotmose II. That's a demotion because she's no longer ruling uh, the country. She's now the wife of the ruler. And when Thotmose II died, she ruled as queen regent for Thotmose III in 1615 BC. 
But she later deposed Thotmose III and decided, you know what, I'm running the country myself. There's other images as well. Now, I have to take credit, I found that image. Um, and it's interesting because here you can see one where her nose is properly intact. And there's this image, which I found. Uh, there's a book called In Praise of Black Women by um, a, a scholar from Guadeloupe called Simone Schwartz Bart. Despite the Jewish sounding name, she's actually a black woman. And uh, people might want to uh, check that out. It's a three volume thing. And while there are problems with the scholarship, um, the book, uh, the three parts, uh, does need to be in everyone's book collection, in truth. So, what else do we know? Um, Hatshepsut, when she proclaimed herself Pharaoh, took the religious titles, the female Horus and the daughter of Ra. She was deeply religious and did much to undermine the veneration of the deity Set. And that's the deity that the Hyksos um, are promoted and identified as their deity, Baal. Her leading statesmen, both of humble origins, Senenmut and Hapu Seneb, oversaw her building activities. She also appointed Asians to powerful positions within the administration and she's the first pharaoh to do so. These Asians, many of them would have been Caucasian, many of them would have been near whites, some would have been Afro-Asians as well. So what did she build? At Karnak, she erected two great obelisks that rose to almost 100 feet. Um, this is what J.A. Rogers says. To make the obelisks still more conspicuous, she had their tops encased in electrum a metal costlier than gold. Electrum was a composition of silver and gold. Silver being rather rarer in Egypt, it was more precious. In the bright sunlight of that rainless land, the obelisks shone with glittering peaks. Their brilliancy, in the queen's own words, lit up the two lands of Egypt. And one of those obelisks is in this um, uh, photograph. At the time that it was constructed, it was the tallest structure in the world. It's not now because it's been subsequently uh, bested by structures in Ethiopia. And then of course, in the modern age where we have skyscrapers and stuff. But at the time that was the largest, the largest, uh, excuse me, the tallest structure in the world. Another structure that she had commissioned was the Deir el-Bakhri temple. And it was cut out of the mountains and dedicated to Amen, Anubis, and Hathor. In this temple are records of her famous maritime voyage to Punt. And Punt, some people think that's where Somalia is today. Some people think it's where Ethiopia is today. Um, but interestingly, Punt was also ruled by a woman. And her name was Queen Eti. Now, in the land of Somalia or Ethiopia or wherever it was, the Egyptians bought incense, animals, animal skins, gum, gold, ivory, and ebony. And to pay for it, they brought weapons, jewelries, and wares. Now, the Deir el Bakhri temple, by the way, this is the name the Arabs call it today. You can see. Um, it be it's carved out the side of a mountain, and here's some of its columns. And I'm going to give you another picture where you can see um, what it looks like from the ground, and very very impressive structure. Now the Queen of Punt um, is depicted, and the person next to her is thought to be the King of Punt. Um, Older scholarship presents the Queen of Pun actually as the dominant figure. And so, um, anyway, her name is Queen Eti, and there she is. Um, there it is. Right, Queen Tia is another important figure. Now, those of you that have seen my book, When We Ruled, will know that that's the sculpture that I put on the front cover of my book. 
And because I have to respect the fact that I'm standing in for Runoka Rashidi, that's one of his photographs of our Queen Tia. Um, and it's a, a, a statuette. It's um, made of um, some kind of glass composition. Um, hope people are feeling that. Now, her daughters with Amenhotep III, again, this is a, a Rashidi photograph, and you can see the daughters, uh, two of them next to each other, um, with a type of hairstyle that is actually, um, in places like Namibia, um, Southwest Africa, you actually see women wearing their hair in that kind of style. So what was going on in Egypt during the time of Queen Tia? Goods entered Egypt from Asia Minor, Crete, Cyprus, and elsewhere in Africa, paid for by Egyptian grain, papyrus, linen, and leather. From Asia Minor came coniferous woods. From Syria came oils, resins, weapons of metal, and wine. From Crete came vases. From Cyprus came copper. From the Aegean, that's um, southern Europe, came silver. From Nubia and the lands of the south came ebony. Elephant ivory, gums, leopard, panther skins, ostrich plumes, and eggs, resins, and a variety of animals, caravan trails of donkeys, mules, and asses, carried goods to and from Egypt, the Western Desert, and the Isthmus of Suez. Goods changed hands with the payment of silver, gold, grain, or copper. One unit or 9.1 grams of copper, gold, equal two units of copper equal 200 units of copper or 200 bushels of grain. Wait a minute, I think I read that wrong. One unit or 9.1 grams of gold equal two units of silver equal 200 units of copper or 200 bushels of grain. The city of Waset, which is now the capital, this is where Thebes or Luxor is today, had a population of one million people. It spread out six square miles on both sides of the Nile. On the edge of the metropolis lay the houses of the nobles, typically of 50 or 60 rooms. They had lakes and flower gardens, all accessed by cool, tree-shaded avenues. Inside were beautifully painted walls, exquisitely inlaid furniture, gorgeous vases and fine sculptures. These craft pieces were in gold, bronze, ebony, ivory and glass. Towards the center of the city stood the royal palace, the House of Rejoicing, which occupied an astounding 32 hectares. Along the Nile, in the epicenter of the city, stood the great temples of Karnak and Luxor, which towered over everything. Their massive pylons, obelisks, and gates of gold and bronze made a huge statement. In their time, the temples were animated by the activities of students and priests. Horse-drawn chariots, sometimes 20 abreast, traversed the sphinx-lined avenues. On the river lay quays where the merchant ships of the Nile mingled with those from the Mediterranean. Across the river to the western plain stood other temples, equally magnificent, and from there led to the Valley of the Kings, the royal graveyard. So do we have a picture of the city of Waset? Waset, one million people, the largest city on earth during this period. And at the far end is the region that we today call Karnak. And at the front end, the region that we today call Luxor. And you can then see the habitations around it. And the typical mansion from the period, these 50 or 60 room mansions, here's a cutaway. Uh, that was published by um, Adolphus Ehrman. And you can see uh, the grand house at the back. Um, very, very impressive. So who was next? Anyone know who this is? People wondering. Here's another image of her. Those two photographs, by the way, were taken by uh, Dr. Rashidi. This is the same woman. Uh, people by now should have worked it out. It's Queen Nefertiti. And I'm sure Sir Mixalot would have something to say also about this uh, uh, image of Nefertiti. 
In other words, did a body shape look any more African? So why is that important? Well, most people are familiar with the Berlin bust forgery. And there's that forged image. But I'm going to show you who some scholars think it really is. Um, the forgery was probably done by an archaeologist called Ludwig Borchardt. And Ludwig Borchardt's wife looks like this. And I have to thank um, African-American scholar Clyde Ahmad Winters, who found that image of Ludwig Borchardt's wife. So the image that most people think of then as Queen Nefertiti, the Berlin bust forgery, is actually Ludwig Borchardt's wife. Okay, so Nefertiti, um, her daughter. Here's one of her daughters, uh, a daughter with uh, Pharaoh Akhenaten. And this image again was photographed by uh, Dr. Rashidi. So who was next? This is Queen Nefertari, Dynasty 19. This is the queen of uh, Ramesses II. Again, Rashidi took this photograph. So what happened to Egypt? Well, after the 20th dynasty, which is 1236 to 1095 BC, Egypt again fell apart. More and more regional power ended up in the hands of the Libyans to the west and the Kushites to the south. And so the northern part of Egypt, say from Memphis on up, was swallowed up by Libya. And then everything from Memphis to the south was swallowed up by Kush. So Egypt more or less disappears off the map. And its new rulers are Libyans and Kushites. Now, a lot of black scholars following the lead of Sheikh Anta Diop and Chancellor Williams dismiss the Libyans as non-black. I think that's premature. I think we need to look at the Libyan evidence before we dismiss them and throw them out as if they're not part of African history. Because as I'm going to show, the Libyan images I have show that they are Africans. Okay, this is uh, Queen Nejemet of the 21st dynasty. Uh, Queen Nejemet is probably Egyptian, and she's the woman that the Daily Mail used to illustrate their article on um, cancer at the beginning of this presentation. So she's probably Egyptian. Uh, Queen Hanatawi is probably Libyan. Now you can see that they're both black. Now the other thing too uh, about Queen Hanatawi and Nejemet is um, Rashidi did take photographs of these, but the, 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 the resolution wasn't really good enough. So I've chosen to use these images rather than Rashidi's. So who was next? Rashidi took this image, uh, Queen Karamama I, 22nd dynasty. Again, she's probably Libyan. So um, I don't fully then agree with the scholars that would throw the Libyans out as if they're not Africans. My thing is we should be claiming it. All right, so that brings me to our second theme. Um, I'm done talking about the ancient Egyptians, and now I'm going to be talking about the Kushites, who overran ancient Egypt at one period, lost control of Egypt, and then continued to rule in Kush in Sudan uh, right up until 350 AD. All right, so here's our map of Kush. The city of Nuri was the first capital of this Kushite golden age. The city next to it, Napata, was the second capital of this golden age. And the city to the east of it, Meroe, was the third capital of this golden age. And as I said, at one time, the Kushites ruled Egypt. They ruled in the Middle East. They ruled North Africa. They even ruled as far as Spain at one point. So how did the Kushites administrate their empire? Well, Kashta, the ruler of Kush, took control of the Egyptian city of Waset in 760 BC. 
and according to the documents, received the divine mandate of the deity Amen to rule. Whether Amen really told him that, we don't know. Following this, he installed his daughter as the successor to the post of high priestess of Amen, ruling in Egypt. And she was contemporaneous with Homer, who wrote interesting things about Cush. Homer is the first Greek writer. So this is now the Greeks stepping out on the world stage. They are now the first civilized people are living on mainland Europe during this period. Homer wrote, among other things, that the Greek deity Zeus, who is really the African deity, Amen, uh, when Zeus comes to earth, would prefer to receive the sacrifices from Cush. Then, once he receives the sacrifices from Cush, then he uh, 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 visits the ancient Greeks. Right now, two of our scholars, uh, Dr. Charles Finch and Larry Williams, said it was the standard practice for Cushite rulers to put their daughters uh, on the thrones of Egypt, ruling as the high priestess of Amen. Let's read what Finch and Williams say. These women, working through their own prime ministers, were in effect rulers of Upper Egypt. They undertook massive restoration and public works in Thebes and throughout Upper Egypt. Their names are on scores of monuments, buildings, and statues. The Kushite pharaohs ruled mainly from Napata and seem to have had the utmost confidence in their female relatives to govern Upper Egypt. So who were these Kushite chief priestesses? Well, that's one of them. Uh, again, Dr. Rashidi took this photograph, and her name is Armenidas I. She became chief prophetess of Amen, the queen of Thebes, and the mistress of Egypt. Records, statues, and statuettes have all survived throughout Egypt, and she had quasi-royal privileges. She had her own prime minister. She was commissioning building projects and public works programs. Now, what was the big achievement of the Kushites ruling over Egypt? The big achievement is this. Um, there were three writing systems um, in Egypt. One was hieroglyphics, one was hieratic, and one was demotic. Hieroglyphics strictly means the carved symbols. If it's not carved, it's not hieroglyphics. Hieratic is where it's written, and demotic is where it's turned into a cursive writing. Now, the word demotic is coming from the word demo, which means the masses. You know, like you've got the word democracy. So demotic, then, is mass literacy. So Hieroglyphics were probably only understood by a, a tiny fraction of the population. Hieratic is the writing of the priests. Demotic is the writing of the masses. And demotic is what appears for the first time in Egypt uh, during this period of Kushite domination. So the Kushites are responsible for mass literacy. Priestess Takushit was one of the daughters of the Kushite high priestesses of Amen. And is that not the most exquisite sculpture you've ever seen? Is that not the most exquisite? And uh, I have to uh, pat myself on the back here because uh, I don't think any of the other black scholars have seen this particular sculpture. So who else was in this dynasty of our female rulers over Egypt? Well, Shepenupet, her niece, succeeded her, but there is confusion of names and details of this dynasty. It is known that A. Shepenupet was the last independent Negro ruler of Egypt, but we don't know which one. It might have been Shepenupet II. The other thing about the, the uh, Shepenupet is um, there's a hieroglyphic symbol which uh, is normally transliterated into European languages as the letter W. 
and we don't know how it's pronounced. All the scholars say it's pronounced as a U, so that becomes Shepin Nupet. Younger scholars think it's pronounced as a W, in which case her name is Shepin Wepet. So it's either Shepin Nupet the second or Shepin Wepet the second. So what happened next? Egypt fell in 663 BC to the Assyrians, and Shepenupet or Shepenwepet II was deposed in the year 654 BC. After this, other Caucasian peoples conquered Egypt the Persians in 525 BC, the Greeks in 332 BC, the Romans in 30 BC, and finally the Arabs in 639 AD. So when people visit Egypt today, the people that you're more likely to come across are going to be the descendants of the Arabs or the Greeks or the Persians. You're unlikely to come across real Egyptians. And if you do come across real Egyptians, they're going to be black. Now, during this period, world politics changes. The Europeans now become the, forerun, the, 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 the foremost people on the planet. Uh, the Roman Empire becomes very, very powerful. Um, China is also powerful during this period. And the country that we today call Ethiopia, um, in those days it was called Aksum, uh, becomes the third most powerful country in the world. So world politics changes. It's no longer about Kemet and Kush, which is where it was at before. Now, once Egypt had fallen, pharaonic culture survived only in Kush. Meanwhile, Egypt was gradually de-Africanized by the various conquests and occupations. So what was going on in Kush? A number of women held the title Kentaka, which means queen mother. And Kentaka, uh, when you Latinize it, it becomes the Roman name Candace or Candace. And so Kandasi is a Romanized version of Kentaka, which is the queen mother title in Kush. And some of these women were heads of state. Uh, Kentaka Kalhata had her own pyramid built at El Kuru. And notably, her pyramid, which is in Kush, Sudan, uses the same color scheme that ancient Egypt uses. Men are shown as red, women are shown as yellow. Let me show you some of that art. Wait a minute, where's my image gone? Well, okay, I'm gonna show you that art in about um, five minutes. I'm gonna come back to this, right? Okay, meanwhile in Egypt, when the Greeks came on the scene, there was intermarriage between uh, Greeks and Egyptians. And by the time we get to the last uh, pharaoh, her name is Cleopatra the Seventh. Cleopatra the Seventh is shown as African in some images. That was photographed by Rashidi. European in other images, and the Daily Mail is of the opinion that that is the truest representation. I share this view. Let me explain why we now think Cleopatra was in between. Well. Um, scholars believe that they've discovered Cleopatra's sister, and her name is Queen Arsinoe. And they believe that they've discovered her too. And when um, the skull shape was discovered, it was found to have had African and European traits, which would suggest uh, African-European admixture. And this is where they're getting the idea from that that must have been true of her sister, uh, Cleopatra the seventh. All right, now Queen Kalhata. Well, can you see here? Um, the male deity is red. The female is shown as yellow. Uh, male is shown as red. Female is shown as yellow. These are all very unnatural colors, and it shows then that if um, you see this in art, these aren't real colors. Uh, red is symbolic of Ra the sun. Yellow is symbolic of the moon, probably Ya, the moon. And that kind of thing you'll see in Egyptian and in Sudanese art. 
And so when you see that, those are symbolic colors. They're not actually people's skin colors. So who were the other uh, Kentuckys that ruled over Kush? An ancient source mentions that Alexander the Great visited Kandasi, the Black Queen of Meroe, in the fourth century BC. She was apparently a wondrous beauty. Kentaka Shanak de Keta was the third known Kentucky to rule Kush by herself, 170 to 150 BC. Sculptures show her in front of her son or by herself. Monuments from her time show the first clearly dated examples of texts written in Meroitic. This was a new script that the Kushites invented to replace hieroglyphics. So who was next? Uh, Kentaka Nawidemak ruled 50 BC. That is from a now destroyed pyramid chapel from Jebel Barkal. Uh, that pyramid chapel no longer exists, but Europeans got there, um, uh, painted it, published it in the 19th century. Uh, now that it's, it was destroyed during the period when the British ruled in Sudan, uh, at least we have this record that it used to exist. We don't know very much about Nawidemak other than her name when she ruled and that particular image. Now, battling the Romans. The Roman conquest of Egypt in 30 BC brought a new challenge to Kush. Augustus Caesar threatened an invasion following his Egyptian campaign. Queen Mother Amenorinas, that's Kentucky Amenorinas, gave the order to march into Egypt and attack the invaders. The Kushites sacked the Egyptian city of Aswan with an army of 30,000 men and destroyed the statues of Caesar in Elephantine. The Romans counterattacked Kush, <clears throat> capturing Kazir Ibrim and invading as far south as Napata, the, the capital city, and sacked it. Armenarinas evaded their clutches. So, what happened next? Armenarinas ordered her armies to march a second time with the aim of seizing the Roman garrison. This time, however, a standoff with the Romans was achieved without fighting. And this has led scholars to work out why. Why would the Romans agree to a standoff without fighting? It seems that the Romans withdrew, declaring Pax Romana, peace. Scholars believe what really happened is, is Amenorinas' forces destroyed the Romans, and rather than admit that they were defeated, Roman historians pretend that what happened instead was a standoff, uh, uh, was agreed without fighting. Um, and so the Roman humiliation has yet to be disclosed because scholars think that the Meroitic account, which is this slab here, which is in the British Museum, we can't really read it. People can read bits, but not enough to interpret word for word what happened. And when it is interpreted, it will give the full extent of the Roman humiliation. Later Candaces, Kentucky Amanishaketo, uh, 10 to 1 uh, BC, she ruled between 10 BC and 1 BC, had a palace at a site called Wad Ben Naka. It was 61 meters square and had columned halls, corridors, and long narrow rooms. It had at least two stories with palatial apartments on the upper floor. From her pyramid treasures were found, including gold, silver, gemstones, wood, and copper alloy. So can we see this gold, the silver, the gemstones, the wood, and the copper alloy? Can we see this stuff? Well, first of all, that is the chapel that belonged to her pyramid at Meroe. And you can see um, she's about size 24. I'm not hating because I like size 24, so I'm not hating. Um, you can see that she's got prisoners, that she's, uh, and this is a typical type of pharaonic propaganda. In other words, um, you know, smiting enemies. And then the pyramid itself. Now, can you see then that what I'm showing you here is really the chapel in front of the pyramid? Now, the pyramid was intact when the Europeans drew it 
in the 1820s. It's not intact now because it's been destroyed. Um, and that act of vandalism, I think, needs, uh, what's the word? We need to equal the score. So the next time you're in Rome, folks, you heard it from me, you know what to do. Anyway, um, the pyramid, what was in it? That is some of the treasures of Armani Shaketo. Here's another example. Two more examples. Here's another example. Here's another one. These treasures are in uh, European museums, particularly in Germany, uh, Berlin. These are signet rings. And these rings were, is what the um, Queen Mother would have used. Uh, you dip it into ink and then put the imprint on documents to show that she signed off those documents. Here are six more of those rings. Okay. Our third and final theme, the Nigeria region, 1000 BC to 1610 AD. Um, this was the presentation I was going to do um, uh, had Rashidi not cancelled. This is So this is my bit now. This is what I would have said. The Nigeria region, um, this is a map showing the ancient Nigerian city-states, nation-states, and so on. And can you see in the center, there's a place called Nupe, and next to it, there's a place called Nok. And archeologists have found at the site of Nok uh, evidence of a widespread civilization going back to 1000 BC. Then you have to the north of this, the Hausa territories. And we're interested in the Hausa city of, which one are we interested in? Um, Zazao. We're gonna be looking at the Hausa city state of Zazao. Some people call it Zaria. And if we look to the west, we have the Yoruba uh, kingdoms. One of them is called Ile Ife, and that's important to our story. And the Yoruba territories is important because in that region is a site called Eredo that I'm going to be spending some time on as well. All right, now, rediscovery of a lost civilization of Nok, 1000 to 300 BC. In 1928, Lieutenant Colonel J. Dent Young, who was an Englishman, led tin mining operations in the Nigerian village of Nok. And this is in the Jos region. During the digs, one of his workers, who was a miner, found a splendid piece of terracotta art. And then as they did more digging, they found more and more pieces. And what that miner, who worked for Lieutenant Colonel J. Dent Young, uh, uh, didn't know is that he was discovering his ancestors' lost civilization in the central Nigeria region. The discoveries were eventually brought to the attention of Bernard Fagg, who was an English cadet administrative officer, and he was also an archeologist. Now the ancient culture was now called the Nok civilization. And it was called that because the tradition is you name a culture after the site where it was first found. It doesn't mean that in the ancient worlds, the Nigerians of that period called it the Nok civilization. We don't know what they called it. We just call it the Nok civilization today because it's the tradition to name the thing after the village in where it's found. Ultimately, 400 pieces of Nok art have been recovered. Scholars now think these art pieces were made by women artists in female workshops. So what did the artifacts show? They are mostly human statues made of terracotta. Terracotta is fired clay. From a few inches in height to almost life size, they depict people wearing rows of bracelets, necklaces, skull caps, and in one instance, a cape. Most show the hair exposed. The hair is inventive with bold, 
highly individual plats, ridges, locks, and bonds. Mr. Fagg, the cadet officer, wrote, the knock people must have taken just as many hours as the chic Lagos ladies of the 20th century do arranging their coiffures. Or to put them into their own historical period, the Mediterranean ladies who were living in their villas north of the Sahara. So what was going on in the Mediterranean during this period? When the Knox civilization was happening, Carthage and Numidia were happening in Africa and the Greek and Roman periods were happening in Europe. Now, what uh, these pieces have been found, unfortunately, they are being looted as we speak, mostly by Swiss gangsters. Um, and one scholar wrote um, a few years ago that these pieces were being looted for 35,000 US dollars per piece. So th this is one of those pieces. Here's another one of the pieces. Okay, let's look at the second one. Can you see that the eyes are diamond shaped? Can you see that the nose is diamond shaped? Can you see that the mouth is diamond shaped? When you take non-geometric shapes and give them geometric shapes, this is called cubism. And this was allegedly uh, invented by Pablo Picasso and Amedeo Modigliani in the 20th century. Now, when we look at these pieces, um, in the first millennium BC, it means then that more than 2,300 years before Pablo Picasso, more than 2,300 years before Amedeo Modigliani, African female artists were dealing with cubism um, all those years ago. Here's another one of these pieces. This one I call The Thinker. and Someone pointed out to me that this piece here, if you were to show that amongst 20th century art, that wouldn't stand out at all. That looks 20th century, even though, again, it's more than our, it's first millennium BC, basically more than 2000 years old. So what was going on in the North in medieval times? The North, meaning the Northern part of the Nigeria, are basically where the Hausas are today. Well, the Hausa Confederation consisted of seven major independent cities and their surrounding territories. Among these cities were Gobir, Biram, Katsina, Kano, Daura, Rano, and Zazao. They flourished from the 11th or 12th centuries up to the early 20th century. And of course, once the British colonized that region, all of that now became northern Nigeria. So what do we know about Zazao, also known as Zaria? Well, Bakwa Turunku founded Zaria city in 1536 after conquering a neighboring fortified city called Kufena. She probably also founded the royal palace of Zaria, which remains such an impressive structure that an architectural authority called Z.R. Dumachowski says, the palace should be preserved as one of the most important monuments of Nigerian national culture. Now, the image that you're seeing is 16th century Zaria. That monument is still there. The photograph was taken by the uh, architect Z.R. Dumachowski. And I think we need to see more of this kind of stuff. On Bakwa Turunku's death, Karama, a soldier, succeeded her. And Princess Amina, who was Turunku's daughter, accompanied him on campaigns. All right, so I think we need to see a bit more of the Zaria city palace uh, built in the mid-16th century. I think we need to see some more. But that's what the outside looks like. Are we enjoying this? That's the plan. Uh, the plan, you can see that there's, what, over a hundred rooms in the palace and the different structures that make up the layout of the structure. 
Uh, this is what was founded by Bakwa Turunku, mid 16th century. The plan was uh, 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 mapped by Z.R. Dumitrovsky. All right, now in the entrance gate, if you enter the entrance and look up, that's what the roofing looks like. Let's go inside. Courtyard G, um, you can see the staircase and then the passage that leads to Courtyard G. And you can see the arches holding the structure up. And this is the women's house, uh, rooms 93 and 94. And again, those complex arches. This is 16th century West Africa, how they were going on. So what do we know about Amina? In 1549, she became the heir apparent. Apparently the title is Magajia or something like that. And she was responsible for ward in the city where she convened daily councils with officials. She also began military training, training in the cavalry. 1576, she became the undisputed ruler of Zazel. And she was distinguished as a soldier and an empire builder. She led campaigns within months of becoming ruler. She built walled forts as area garrisons to consolidate the territory conquered after each campaign, which popularized the earthen city wall fortifications, which became characteristic of all Hausa city-states since then. Towns grew within these protective walls, many of which are still in existence, and they are still called Ganyuwa Amina, which apparently is the Hausa term Amina's walls. So anytime people see walled forts in the Nigeria region, there's often the suspicion that Amina might have been responsible. All right, Queen Amina. That's the image on a 1975 Nigerian stamp. And you can see her on horseback, um, and you can see the typical types of Hausa architecture uh, in the background. And this is a Nigerian postcard, again, supposedly depicting Amina and giving you the kind of attitude and look that she um, must have had. So what do the documents say about her? The Cardo Chronicles says, every town paid her tribute. The king of Nupe sent her 40 eunuchs and 10,000 colas. In her time, all the products of the West came to Hausaland. So why eunuchs? Now, um, what happened in um, the medieval world is if a man was partly castrated, not to the point where he couldn't perform, but to the point where he couldn't reproduce, um, that was very, very popular with elite and aristocratic women. And so those 40 eunuchs were basically for her and her pleasure. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is uh, many scholars bring up the kind of abuses of power. What happens when men are in power and they abuse that power? So you end up with Mansa Suleiman with his 100 concubines. But people don't talk about what happens when women are in power and they abuse it. So she ended up with 40 eunuchs. Anyway, Amina's achievement as a conqueror was the closest that any ruler had come to bring the region now called Nigeria under a single authority. Let me say something about that. I'm using the term Queens of Nigeria to refer to the territory, but strictly speaking, when these Queens were ruling, the word Nigeria didn't exist. Uh, the concept of Nigeria didn't exist. I'm just using it for convenience so we know what it refers to. Now, some strange news stories. The Sunday Times on the 23rd of May 1999 carried a valuable article entitled Jungle Reveals Traces of Sheba's Fabled Kingdom. The Daily Mail got in on it 24th of May. Was the Queen of Sheba really a black woman from Nigeria? And that's one of the articles. Now I know what you're thinking, you can't see it, but I'm ready for your. A lost kingdom thought to be that of the fabled Queen of Sheba and possibly the earliest African city ever discovered has been found by a British archaeologist. Dr. Patrick Darling discovered the site which covers more than 400 square miles while exploring the southern rainforest of Nigeria. 
He found mud walls up to 70 feet high and a 100 mile ditch, which are thought to be part of defensive works. Now, the real story was this. The Queen of Sheba link was probably hype. The queen of the real Queen of Sheba was an African queen, but she's from the other side of Africa, uh, where Ethiopia and Eritrea is today. Um, some think she was fully Ethiopian, some think she was half Ethiopian, half Yemeni, but whichever be the case, the other side of the African continent, and she lived 3,000 years ago. What was undeniable, however, is that an African queen called Bilikizu Sumbo built by far the largest city the world had ever seen. In size, it dwarfed Baghdad, it dwarfed Cairo, it dwarfed Cordova, and it dwarfed Rome. Dates such as 800 AD have been suggested. Now, what was going on in the world at this time? 800 AD, you had ancient Ghana was live and you know rich ethiopia in east africa was kicking it the swahili states were uh, just about coming together at this time period medieval nubia was at the height of its power but europe was in its dark ages because the western part of the uh, roman empire collapsed europe was in its dark ages and the moors were ruling a brilliant uh, civilization in spain so what was found in this uh, uh, Nigerian culture of Eridu, what was found? They found a huge earthen wall, 100 miles long, which encircled the, the city. From the base of the ditch to the summit of the rampart was a towering 70 feet. According to Mark McCaskill, the rampart was 100 miles and formed a rough circle enclosing more than 400 square miles a 400 square mile city with a 100 mile wall and ditch around it. Scholars have therefore estimated that Eridos construction involved about 1 million more man hours than were necessary to build the Great Pyramid. Okay, we're in the home straight now, the home straight. A Nigerian professor called Ekpo Eyo was at one time the head of the National Monuments and Museums Commission. And he's a leading authority on uh, Nigerian art. He narrates a curious oral tradition concerning Oni Oluwo, who was a Yoruba ruler. The tradition says she was walking around the capital city of Ile Ife, and her regalia got splashed with mud. Oluwo was so upset by this that she ordered the construction of pavements for all the public and religious places in the city. All right, now hold that thought because I'm going to show you how that's going to come together to build a new chapter of black history. There was a German professor who was writing between 1906, 1913, 1920, that kind of period. The German professor was Leo Frobenius. And a lot of scholars today, especially um, his fellow Europeans, think he was mad. And they think he was mad because he would say some, what they considered to be off the wall things. And I'm gonna quote one of these quote unquote, off the wall statements. I cannot finish without devoting a word or two to a certain symptomatic conformity of the Western Atlantic civilization with its higher manifestations in America. Its cognate features are so striking that they cannot be overlooked. And as the region of Atlantic African culture is Yoruba, it seems to be a present question whether it might not be possible to bring the marvelous Maya monuments into some prehistoric connection with those of Yoruba. So what Frobenius is suggesting is ancient Atlantis is really Yoruba land and the Yorubas spread their civilization all the way across to the Mayas in the Mayans, excuse me, in ancient America. 
So Frobenius believes the Mayan civilization in America is the child of the Yoruba civilization in Africa. And this is why so many of Frobenius's uh, 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 colleagues thought he was mad and why many European scholars today diss Frobenius and they diss anybody who quotes Frobenius. Now, Frobenius's ideas received some confirmation in 1954. And I'm going to quote what David Kelly says. The kind of field, the kind of evidence field archaeologists like is the pavement of Ile Ife, a former Yoruba capital. It was made from broken pots herds that were decorated by rolling corn cobs over their surface before firing. Paul Mangelsdorf, who had seen some of the sherds, assured me about 1954 that they were indeed Zia maize, an American plant. Another interpretation of Yoruba tradition is that the capital was moved from Ile Ife to Old Oyo about AD 1100 or earlier. If so, this site provides the hard evidence that archaeologists want for American plants in Africa in pre-Columbian times. So what's being said? I mentioned the tradition that Oni Oluwo had um, the city of Ile Ife paved, um, and the pavements have been found. And those pavements were found to have been decorated by corn cobs, corn cobs also known as ZMAs. And the decorations must have been done 1100 AD or earlier, some say 1000 AD. Now, the significance of the corn cobs is. At, at that time in the world, the only place where Zia maize or corn cobs was growing was America. And that means the Yorubas must have been in contact with America. And that means the likeliest people in America would have been the civilization there. The main civilization there was the Mayans. And that would suggest then that the Yorubas and the Mayans were in contact with each other and they were in such contact with each other that during the time of Oni Oluwo, they were importing American corn cobs on such a scale that they were able to pave the city of Ile Ife with those corn cobs. So what does it look like? Those decorations on the floor, those are corn cobs that have been, um, you know, pot serds have been added to strengthen it, but basically that's corn cob decorations, which have been used essentially as pavements. And then across the city of Ile Ife, pavements like this have been found, meaning that the amount of corn cobs that were um, um, imported were on a vast, vast, vast scale. And this was done 1100 AD or earlier. This was done. Um, 400, 500 years before Christopher Columbus. And so what conclusions should we draw? There's only two conclusions. Either the Yoruba sailed to ancient America during the Yoruba period, um, during the Oluwo period, made contact with the Native Americans, possibly the Mayans, and bought the corn cobs, or Native Americans, probably Mayans, sailed to Yoruba land with boat, you know, um, boats full of corn cobs, which they then um, um, sold to the Yorubas. One of the two. And finally, is this the face of Oni Oluwo? If you look at the very, very fine Yoruba sculptures, um, Yoruba masterpieces, one of them is definitely, definitely a woman. And in my opinion, purely my opinion, my speculation, I think that is her. All right, so that concludes the session, Queens of the Nile and the Niger regions. Hope people enjoyed that. People are going to be, well, some people, some of us, we're not, we're not particularly disposed to royalty, yeah? We want to know about the ordinary people, all right? That's how some people uh, are thinking right about now. So what, what do we know? What do we know about um, how the the 
women in general, yeah, the standing of women in general within the societies of the ancient now uh, or ancient Nigeria? Um, we do know some things actually. Um, let me uh, uh, get something. Hang on one second. I'm gonna, just going to come. Going to get something. Come back. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah this is. Uh, I'm quoting here from John Jackson, right. and he's quoting Diodorus Siculus. Um, he says, "Among private citizens, the husband, by the terms of the marriage agreement, appertains to the wife, and it is stipulated between them." that the man shall obey the woman in all things, right? <laughs> right, and there are Egyptian marriage contracts that say this. Okay. Yeah, they, they, really, they really are. Um, Brifo, there's a scholar called Robert Brifo, did a book called The Mothers. He reproduces mm -hmm. the marriage contracts. Right, and right. so what Diodorus quotes it as saying is actually what they say. Yeah, so what it is then is that there's a level of matriarchy that's greater than what the black world is used to seeing today right now mm -hmm. um in yoruba land um because we know so much less about the civilization does that make sense mm -hmm. i i don't remember reading anything by any yoruba scholars that are specifically dealing with gender politics in the medieval world you mm -hmm. see because mm -hmm. where what we know is so much further behind so we know about the art, we know about the religion, but the kind of sociology of the male-female relationships, uh, we know so much less. Does that make sense? Yes, and in the case of places like Hausa land, um, the fact that you know uh, that's Islamic, that will again change up the dynamics. Quite significantly. Well, yeah. what we, we, we can say um, this is not quite Hausa land, but, um, but Ibn Battuta, and yeah. one other scholar, I believe, who visited mm -hmm. uh, West Africa during the Ghana uh, Empire, no, sorry, not Ghana, Mali, 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 Mali. Mali was surprised um, at the the standing uh, and say, the prominence. So yeah, we do know that. Um, yeah, so true, yeah. say, true, say. And yeah. that probably would have filtered through to House of Land as well. And then um, recently, there's an album that's recently been released. Uh, by a sister by the name of um, Rhapsody, yeah? She's a, mm -hmm. a rapper. And basically, mm -hmm. she's got a song on the album. It's called Eve. The album's called Eve. And she's got a song on the album named after a prominent woman in history, yeah? One of the songs is called Hapshetsu, yeah? Mm -hmm. And she got the idea from um, from Queen Latifah. But Queen yeah. Latifah said to her that, that Hapshetsu uh, was the first female ruler Mm -hmm, of ancient mm -hmm. Egypt, yeah, and this mm -hmm. seems to be a, um, a popularly held belief. True, you, you, you mentioned um, um a, a while ago, but evidently this is mm -hmm. false. Um, so how how did this idea that she's the first become um a prominent idea? I think what it is is um 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 uh the problem with the first dynasty women. I don't think there's any images of them. You right. understand? The mm -hmm. problem with Nita Kurti or Nita Chris, I don't think there's an image of her. I don't think there's an image of Iput. You understand? I don't mm -hmm. think there's an image of Sebek Neferura. So right. the, the first one that's Pharaoh, where there's a whole heap of images, is Hatshepsut the Great. So I think that's what contributed to the idea. But she's not, she's not the first. The, 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 to rule as queen, the first mm -hmm. one is actually the second ruler of Egypt, Merneith. Yes, yes, yes. And yes, to yes. rule as Pharaoh, Mm -hmm. I think um, uh, Neith Hotep, no, or oh, I got my facts from whichever, whichever be the case. Mm -hmm. um, to rule as Pharaoh, in other words, two queens ruled in the first dynasty. Yes, yes, Just yes. Just let yes, that yes. sink in. Right, right, right. Just let that sink in. And give, yes, give yes. That, the, the dates is, uh, for the first dynasty are 5,000 5, something BC, right? 5,000. That's something. right, yeah, yeah. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. And, and now you get people using the short chronology nonsense and we'll try and put all that back to 3,200 BC, but that's just nonsense. Right. Yeah. 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 Say so, you, you might you might need to now give a, a brief explanation about the chronology, just so for the so people can okay, very it. simply. Yeah. Uh what we know about ancient Egypt is because an ancient Egyptian called Manathan wrote a chronology uh for the Greeks. Uh, he wrote it for Ptolemy Philadelphus. Mm -hmm. And he laid out the different pharaohs 
and he put them into the different families. That, and the way we teach Egyptology today is based entirely on what Manetho tells us. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Okay, now, um, when you add up the timeline, the first, the first dynasty becomes 5717 BC. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. Now, because that's 5,000 years before Greece, 2,000 years before Sumer, European scholars don't like that because it would mean the unambiguous African origin of civilization. Mm. So a lot of them then have found ways to, to cut the timeline and they presented fictitious timelines that where Egypt begins 3,200, 3,100 BC and put this fiction in the books and then put it all over the TV, all over the internet. So everywhere people pick up information, they're picking up fiction. Mm -hmm. And what it was, was some of our scholars, John Jackson, Chancellor Williams, and Yusef Ben Yochanan, all protested. And they all warned their readers, these timelines are fiction. Right. Yeah. Um, and what I've done is I'm the first one uh, following in the footsteps of these three scholars to actually mm -hmm. reconstruct the timeline myself. Mm -hmm. No, I'm lying. I'm the second person to reconstruct the timeline myself. The first person was Chin Weizu. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but Chin Weizu is, uh, he's voting Liberal Democrat. He's going with something in between. You understand? <laughs> yes, um, yes. Now, let me be quite clear. Chin Weizu is scholarly, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yeah? yes, yes. Um, he let me see his paper, and it's a good paper, but right. I don't agree with it. So I'm not hating. I'm just saying, make it quite clear. Love what you did, bro. I don't, but I just don't agree with it. Is is his paper the published? Person, huh? Is his paper published? It should. I don't know if he, I don't know if he, he, he if he managed to um get get it published. But yeah. certainly, I saw the draft. Okay, because I've never, I've never come across it. So I know I know you quoted it in your book in terms of yeah. his date, but I I never come across it. So yes, that's that's an interesting one. What I can do is, is write to him, and if yeah. he if he's agreeable, yes. Uh, I can show you the paper, but only if he's a people. Yeah. All right, mm -hmm. cool. So, family, um, if you want to know more about the the um, brother Robin Walker's, uh, you know, groundbreaking work on the correction of the the so called Egyptian chronology, uh, you have to get when we ruled. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, there's, a, there's a full breakdown uh, in there. I've got a question from uh, May Nubia, who was unable to come on uh, uh, vocally. Um, she says, "Hi, Robin. Quick question: Would you agree?" that in the Kandakes of Kush, uh, holding back the Romans from invading Kush, they were responsible for pre preventing a European invasion by approximately 2,000 years? That's an interesting question. That's a heavy question. No, no, I'm not going to front. That's a heavy question. Mm. Damn. Um, whoever that is, yeah. Yeah, whoever that is, they've been thinking. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, heavy question, heavy, heavy, heavy question. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I think there's something in it, right? Because um, if you you check it, yeah, the 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 Romans just walked into Egypt. Yes. Yeah. Not no real resistance, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if they were able to do that, yeah, um, it could well be that medieval Nubia would have been wiped out before it began. You know, yes. and yes. it may well be that you know that we we now. Um, Sudan is now the limits of black history mm -hmm. now. Yeah? yeah, it could well be that Sudan wouldn't have existed. Right, right, right. Interesting. It, yeah. Interesting question on, on this one, though, because remind me of the, of the king, um, uh, the, the Roman king who, who led this first invasion. Like, could you mention the presentation? You said, um, you said um, Augustus Caesar. That's right, that's right. That's right. The, the emperor. So was it, was, it, was it under Augustus Caesar that this would have happened, right? That's right. That's right. The reason why I'm asking is because there is a, a legend about, I believe it's Alexander the Great. Yeah. No, 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 he's before that. Right. But this, 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 this is the point I'm trying to make because that, why, why I'm using the term legend now is because some people consider this to be uh, fictional in, in terms of Alexander the Great have, trying to, um, to invade Kush and uh, being repelled by, by a similar story by the Kandakis. Is that yeah. a fictional story or not? Um, no one really knows. Um, right. Chancellor Williams says that um, Alexander the Great didn't try it just in case he lost. Right. Do you see? That's the way Chancellor presents it. Right. Um, and he might be right. He, he might be right. Okay. All right. We've got another question here. Um, 
we said says great show is there any references you can shed light on on the curriculum taught to the queens of africa wow i say <laughs> listeners are asking some heavy heavy questions basically I, th I think he's referring to what like their educational process so like, what was education like for women uh, in these ancient african civilizations honest opinion i haven't got the faintest um mm -hmm. that's above um, where my knowledge base is at. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, in the case of ancient Egypt, we know a little bit about education because we know that, you know, the kind of things that would have happened at school and the way that, uh, for example, Tutankhamen, how he was taught. We know, right, you know, right. that um, um, it, 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 the kind of things that he would have to write out. And mm -hmm, if his mm -hmm. correction, if, he's, if there was errors, he was corrected with red ink. Right, yeah, so the, right, the idea right. of him writing in black and the teacher correcting him in red yeah mm -hmm. that kind of mm -hmm. thing is what we do now mm -hmm. does that make sense mm -hmm. and we yes, know yeah. um that with the ancient egyptians they had things like um the per anks which is your university kind of thing uh, mm -hmm. and people like anthony browder talks about the kind of things that were taught in places like Luxor. does that yeah. make sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um there's speculation that there's a site in Kush called Musarrat el Sufra. Um, and Sudanese people tell me today that they think that's a university. Right, right. Um, yeah. Um, it's a, a massive structure, and it's probably the biggest structure in Kush. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the position of, of the scholars is they don't know what it is or what it's for. Right. But right. Sudanese people say they, they, they're sure it's a uni. Okay. So presumably yeah. that type of education existed. Um, in places like Yoruba land, you would have had, um, um, what do you call it, um, guilds, the guild system, mm -hmm. where um, information is being passed on through families, mm -hmm. and families will then develop certain skills, glass, that kind of thing, which would mm -hmm. then be passed on from generation to generation. But whether people receive a broad education or a narrow skills-based education, I really don't know. Right. So the question right. that the people the people have asked is is beyond uh, what I what I know. Can can we assume that because you you mentioned per aunt here per aunt the, the priesthoods would have been educated in, in what would have been called per aunt, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So can we assume, but via the presence of um, of the women in the priesthood, that they would have been educated in, in you know what I'm saying they, they would have been given significant within the priestly education system. Without a doubt. Without a doubt um and certainly if, if you take someone like uh who we do know something about cleopatra mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um yes she's greek period but apparently she was able to address her subjects in whatever language they addressed her in so if a subject was speaking egyptian she would answer mm -hmm. egyptian if, if the mm -hmm. subject was speaking greek if the subject was speaking cushitic she would answer in cushitic right yeah and, um, go on, go on, go on. and one of the presents that she made mark anthony was a mm. library of two hundred thousand books wow <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, right, yeah. Right, right. so 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 as an so, intellect you're talking about some, some you know some heavy people yes 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 mm -hmm. so then um, we also know that the people um of medieval uh kush um and so nubia yeah but, but there, there was a high level of literacy in general. Oh, they, they, they were on. The, the, yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, in medieval Nubia is um um uh, probably one of the best examples of literacy mm -hmm. the black race has ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, some mm -hmm. of their archivists uh, were reading eight different languages. Yeah, some of their stuff mm -hmm. is in um, uh, Meroitic. Some of their stuff is in Old Nubian. Some of their stuff is in Coptic. Some of their mm -hmm. stuff is in um, Greek Creole, which is halfway between Greek and Nubian. Some of their mm -hmm. stuff is in Greek, some of it's in Roman, some of it's in Arabic, and some of it's in Turkish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. see. All right, family. So um, anybody else um, who wants to ask a question, feel free. If you cannot see the StreamYard link on the page currently, please um, refresh the page if you're on the website or if you, you can go to the YouTube and you'll find uh, the StreamYard link in the chat okay you'll find the stream yard link there if you want to come on uh, and ask brother robin uh, a question feel free to do so or as ones have been doing already you can just type it in uh, in the interim i'm going to ask another question 
Brother Robin, you mentioned um, Keredu Ankh, yeah, the mother of Imhotep. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I was having a conversation uh, with somebody the other day uh, about the fact that we know so much. So we know the name Imhotep for quite a bit. He's one of the most popular names in the Black Conscious Scholarship community, right? Mm -hmm. But still very little seems to be known about him, about his life, other than the fact that he was Prime Minister, he was an architect, he was a medicine man, he was a genius, um, um, and these things, yeah. So many people would have been hearing the name uh, Kelly Ark for the first time. Do we know any any specific details about her life? Same problem. Exactly the same problem. This is this is this is this is the real the real issue. Mm. Why Imhotep is important is mm -hmm. he's the first person in history mm -hmm. who is not a god or a king. Right. Do you see? Right. Um, and that's why he's famous. That's why he stands out from everybody because history in those days was really gods and kings. Yes. 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 Yeah. In the case of Kara Duank, um, trust me, I don't think you would get more than a paragraph, mm. if that, mm. about her. Mm. At the present state of knowledge. Now, it could well be that we, you know, there's a document to be discovered. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah? But right now, um, um, it, it, we know her name and we've got a portrait. Right, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, bearing in mind that a lot of the, the, the documentation from uh, ancient Kemet this basically no longer exists. So there true, are some true. Who, but the, the fact that we can name somebody from seven thousand years ago. I mean, you can't name anybody from even three thousand years ago in Britain. True, true, true. Yeah, <laughs> true. I, I will say, however, that the the name, sorry, the the Patar Hotep, he yeah. would have been a contemporary of of Imhotep. No, right? no, he's later. Patar Hotep is fifth okay. dynasty. So I, Imhotep is third. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, I was. I was. I brought him up in relation to the question about the education system, but we know oh, that. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. that, that Hotep was more specifically. Well, from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong. He seemed to be educating boys. His education, that his lessons, um, appear to have been administered to boys. True say, true say, true say. Okay. All right, family. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, once again, Kings and Queens, StreamYard, um, the link is in both chats. So if you're on the YouTube or you are uh, on the website, feel free to click that link um, and uh, get your question through. Um, you can post a question in either chat uh, if you wish. Um, and we will ask Brother Robin those questions. Big up to Tony Warner, who's locked in, locked on. Um, yeah, yeah, if you go, that, yeah, you know, Tony no, Warner, in, Kings and Queens, you know what I'm saying? So you can comment under the video as well. That Tony Warner has said thank you very much. Um, and if you don't know Tony Warner, you need to get to know. I'm sure Brother Robin will agree with me. Um, no, basically, Mr. Black British History. Straight. Mm. Straight, yeah, straight. And that, that, that's quite an endorsement coming from the Black History Man himself. Black History Walks, Kings and Queens, yeah. Check out Black History Walks um, if you want to know more about Tony Warner. And I do encourage you, once we get over COVID-19, to go on uh, a Black History Walk, yeah. Literally, it does what it says on the tin. You will be amazed as to the extent of Black History that and exists. And the, um, the, 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 um, the, 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 um, the, um, the, 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 the Thames trip. You've been Thames on the trip. I don't think I've been on the Thames Street. I went, I went on the city of, of London one. Bredrin, Bredrin. Uh, Thames, that's where it's at. Okay, all right. We're yeah. going to do we'll work that out there. We'll work that yeah. out. So you've got the recommendations there, Kings and Queens. Check out Black History Watch. Just Google that and it will take you to the link. We've got a question um, from uh, Kemi Akintan. Um, it says, is there any scope to find out more about the Knox civilization? Other than buying when we ruled, uh, go ahead, Robert Robin. <laughs> um, unfortunately, first of all, big up to uh, Kemi. Um, um, yeah, uh, what was I saying? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. What we know about it is so limited, it's not true. You understand? So there's mm. a book by um, a Swiss art thief called um, Count de Groon. No. Uh, what's Did you say art thief? He's an art thief. Yeah, yeah. And it's not me yeah. saying that he's an art thief. Other white scholars have denounced him as an art thief. Wow. Yeah. Bernard uh, de Groon. I think that's yeah, Bernard de Groon has written a book called The Birth of Art in Africa. Yeah. Right. 
There's another book by Gert Chiesi, uh, Knock Art, Ancient Nigeria, 500 BC, something like that. And most of what we know is really coming from those two books. And both books, uh, even the second one, Gert Chiesi, talks about how to buy knock art and how to avoid forgery, meaning that it's a guide for Europeans to, to take our things. Mm. Yeah. And outside of that, I can't really think of too many other things because most of the information I know about knock is coming from those two scholars. Bernard Fagg has written a book called Knock Terracottas. And there's the professor from Nigeria, Ekpo Eyo, who's written several books, uh, 2,000 Years of Nigerian Art, um, them kind of books, which have all got big sections on the, on the Knock civilization. What, what's, the, what's the reason behind the, the belief that the Knock art is the work of women? Because it's terracotta. African culture splits uh, metals, which is man ting, and terracotta, which is female. Right. Okay. Yeah. And that, that's quite rigid. So if you see terracotta, then you okay. automatically assume uh, uh, females. And because all the art seems to be terracotta, then that would mean that, you know, those are the artists. It is, in terms of the figures, do, do, do we, is there any suggestion in terms of the gender of the majority of people depicted in the figures? Both both men and women are depicted, but if you look at the way the women are de depicted, the the attention given to the hairs, the hair, and the mm. way the the elaborate uh, decoration and ting and ting, yeah, you, you, you don't know it was a woman that did that 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 that, that yeah. made that art, yeah. Okay, now mm -hmm. I'm I'm and I'm, I may have missed something here. We've got a question in, in the chat, so I'm gonna come to that in a second. I may have missed something, so forgive me if I did. But you, we we've spoken about in terms of the Nile Valley. He's talking about women uh, as uh, as rulers and as priestesses. Uh, do we know um, of any women who were uh, scribes or any, in any form of scholarship? Um, according to Charles Finch, mm -hmm. um, the goddess of writing is Shesheta. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Shesheta is she's shown as you know someone inscribing on a wall, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she. And that represents a mythology that um, some woman in the distant past invented writing and was then deified on the name of Shesheta, you see. Mm -hmm. Now, she's the counterpart of, of Nehuti. Correct. Mm -hmm. so, okay, cool. All right. Um, uh, and apparently she's, she's associated with science as well. That's what I'll throw that in there. Um, yeah, true. Say. And that would then mean that women invented science as well, if you think about it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, EX greeting my brother says, in terms of teaching uh, children our history, what would be the most important starting point? Um, okay, well, I've written a children's book called um, uh, Black History Matters, and people could start there. There's also a woman called Kandasi Chimbiri, and Kandasi Chimbiri is probably our leading children's author like that. She's written things like, she's written something called Step Back in Time, Ancient Kush. Mm -hmm. She's written a book on Ancient Egypt, the Old Kingdom. And her book, Ancient Egypt, the Old Kingdom, um, has even been published in Italian. Yes, you heard that correct. <laughs> yeah. Um, she's also written the, the thing on Windrush. She's also written something on the, the history of the Afro Cone. You understand? So if you're online right now, her company is called Golden Destiny. So check out her company, Golden Destiny, and all those books are children's books, right? Then there's, um, who else? There's uh, Michael Williams. Is it Williams? Someone correct me. Uh, the BIS Posse. Uh, Next in science. I can't, it's not, it's different. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, anyway, Google it, BIS, which means Blacks in Science. And they put together a bunch of books. I think there's eight of them in the series, which is Black People in the History of Science, and there's questions and answers that you can do. Uh, me and my team have done a book called um, Black British History, uh, Black Influences on British Culture, 1948 to 2016, which is 33 classroom lessons. Is it 33 or 31? Can't remember. Classroom lessons 
where again, you can teach yourself black history and it's aimed at your 11 to 14 year olds. You understand? So there's, there, there, there's material there. That's the point I'm making. Enough things are going. You, you, you've got one, um, 19, 19 black questions as well. Is that still in print? Yeah, it's still in print. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Check that one out as well, family. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, there's, there's, there's enough places um, to start. I, I would also suggest, for those um, who have When We Ruled here, the, um, the first uh, chapter, the introduction, where the, um, for, for if you are trying to administer Black history lessons to your children. The first chapter where he breaks down the um, the, the the parameters of history, and you, and you break down uh, the four aspects of history from our perspective that we need to you know be dealing with. Um, I think that's important as well, just to put the, the history and the education of history in a context. Yeah, um, I, I suggest that one reads that if before teaching or whilst teaching their children Black history for a bit of perspective. Um, right. Um, and another question, where's the best place for them to buy your books, Robert Robin? I was going to get to that later, but we'll ask it now. Um, in truth, um, now, now that we're in lockdown and all them things, so just, just online, Amazon. Yeah, yeah. so hit up Amazon um, and we'll get to and, that. And, and, and right. if you're having any difficulty getting hold of when we ruled, the, the version that's live now is a version by Black Classic Press, the American edition. So Black Classic Press have a website. So go through their website if you want to. You, you're trying to get hold of when we ruled. But all my other books, Amazon. Well, I have in my hand the self-published version. <laughs> as, as you can see, it says Reclaw there. You know, say I've actually got the first edition as well. But um, I, I had a, I, I had a, um, uh, I, I ran a joke on one of my students in in our in our homeschoolers group one time. I put the book in front of him and said to him, he's got to read it in a month. And he took me seriously and walked home with my book. <laughs> so he still has it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He, he never he never accomplished the task though. I would I would be more impressed if he went home with it and um and, and did it, but he, he didn't quite do it. But he did start. He read, he read some papers, you know. Like 50 mm -hmm. That's quite funny. But yeah, family. Um so yeah, to hit up the Amazon. We've got another question online. Um, I'm I'm feeling like somebody wants to come through live, you know. So I'm gonna say it again. The, the, the link is on stream, sorry, is StreamYard, yeah? So if you if you cannot see the link on the on the gotquishtv.com uh, page, streaming page, then refresh the page, yeah? Uh, scroll down a little bit and you're going to see a link that begins HTTP, HTTPS, uh, the symbol is StreamYard, yeah? Click that. and um, Or click on the video, go to the YouTube, and you'll be able to access it from there, uh, and you can come live. We do have another question um, on comments on the page and it says greetings has brother robin heard of nubia wardford i have um an african-american sister archaeologist who's doing work in sudan she has claimed to have found objects ten thousand years old therefore would he agree that there is evidence to show that um african history starts before kush I i'll let you answer that brother robin um i've never heard of this woman so what I'd say is, is someone send me the link and I'll find out what she's dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I will say this much respect. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, anyone that is um, um, actually digging up. Yes. Yeah, and um, I have to say respect. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I say someone send me the link and I, I can comment. I'll be sure to do that. I, I came across her name some years ago mm -hmm. because uh, Mama Marimba Ani um recommended that we get in touch with her and we, we 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 tried to link her up for a radio interview at one point um and i'm not sure it quite happened but i did link her up on facebook um but she, yeah she's doing she she started around the same time as um anthony brother respect in terms of but, but obviously she well she doesn't have the the level of resources that anthony brother does but she's doing the work still mm -hmm. i will say though because the sister in the question mentioned course yeah but it, it is um it is a given that the civilization uh, that um, referred to as Tar City, which is in the area of Nubia, Kush, etc., is older than Kemet. That's that's just a fact. Yeah. Um, but there is there, for, to, to date, do we have uh, a a record in terms of a pr pr perspective that date as to how old? Um. What, this is what happened. Um. Professor Bruce Williams who was a white professor at the University of Chicago, 
he was the one that went public in 1979 mm -hmm. with what they've got on Tarsetti. Mm -hmm. And Van Sertima wisely realized that if Bruce Williams isn't questioned on what he's got, he's going right. to be let on by the establishment and he's going to change his story. Van right. Sertima said that. Right, right, and right. so they questioned Bruce Williams and Bruce Williams said the period where Nubia had kings, they had 300, no, excuse me, 200 to 300 years worth of kings before the first pharaoh of Egypt, pharaoh, Narmer, Mena, Menes, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. And it it's, uh, turns out that Van Sertim was, was right. Um, he was lent on, and Bruce Williams has changed his story. In yeah. other words, man's not coming as hard now as he was. Yeah? So, mm -hmm. yeah, it would appear to be two to three hundred years. So whatever date you put First Dynasty Egypt, whatever right. that date right. is, mm -hmm. two to three hundred years earlier is mm -hmm. Nubia. Okay, cool. Get it? Um, and so if you want to go short chronology, if mm. Egypt is 3,200, then Nubia is 3,500. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Get it? Mm -hmm. If you want to go long chronology, if Egypt is if, if Egypt is 5,700, then Nubia is 6,000. All right. Yeah. Well, family, I'm going to make sure that um, Brother Robin is, is exposed to uh, Sister Nubia Wolfer's work, and then we'll see what we can do. We may be able to get her, feature her on Got Kush TV uh, at some point. I'm going to give this another five minutes here for people to come through if they want to come through live, and if you've got any more questions, feel free. Once again, the StreamYard link is, in, is on the, 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 the stream page, um, or you can access it from the YouTube chat, Kings and Queens. Um, so, yeah. Um, enough things there's been a lot of things said um in relation to the queens of ancient now valley um and uh nigeria yeah i do want to ask this question brother robin yeah, because you mentioned the date of the knock civilization uh beginning 1000 bc and this yeah. might sound strange to people because we're not used to hearing about civilization um in west africa uh in the bc period in general yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and so that would be the oldest. And the next would be, um, from my understanding, the Soninke uh, people who True. they True. found in Ghana, um, the city of uh, Jene, um, and and these kind of, which is about three hundred BC, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so in 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 that respect, now, um, like I'm trying to frame frame the question uh, properly, um, but. Yeah, like, let me ask you like this first, and then we'll get to, back to that. In terms of what is called, because people generally deal with civilizations and then cultures and make a <laughs> distinction in terms of history. What yeah, uh, some people say that the Nox civilization should be called a culture. Right. Yeah. So what 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 is it? What distinction are they making? Yeah, what they're talking about is is the existence of cities. Mm -hmm. Do you see? Um, the word civilization is coming from the word for city. You understand? And mm -hmm. no knock um, civ no knock city has been found yet. Right. But what we do know is that the knock will probably work working iron around two thousand BC. Okay. And then once you've got iron, that automatically means your agricultural expansion because you've got iron tools to work the soil. Mm -hmm. Once you've got iron, you've got access to weapons, which then means you've got control of a large area. Do you see? You can then make, and once you've got art, that automatically means the belly politics have been taken care of. Well taken. So then it, it still stands then that the, the oldest city that we know about in West Africa is Jene. Uh, yeah, Jene or, or, or one of them. Some people, are, there's one that might be older called, I think it's called Massina. Yeah. But you're talking around first millennium BC, and I think some people are putting the date at 800 BC for the very earliest. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so with West Africa, it's um, between 1100 and 12 and 2000 BC for stone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because stone structures in places like Dar Tichit Walata, mm -hmm. and they're very impressive stone structures, by the way. Right, right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then. The, the term city is around 800 BC. Mm -hmm. um, some people put Gene at 300, some predate it, whatever. But yeah, we're talking the same talk. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. And cool. then by the time you've got to Erido, you've got a city that's that's two thirds the same size as modern London. Modern London. 
Not mm -hmm. ancient London, modern London. Mm. Yeah, 400 square miles. Mm. Mad, yeah? Kings and Queens, the knowledge, the information is a lot, yeah? I hope that you are enjoying and feasting from the wellspring of the information of, of the... We are all responsible for guiding and engaging in uh, our own research independently. And so I'm hoping you're learning to, start, you know, of some skills and some platforms and some sources that you can go and look into uh, yourself. Let me see if... Um, ah, so um, sis, um, uh, um, Neb Mare Lamin uh, has shared the link to Sister Nubia Warford's website, yeah? Right Respect. Right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna drop that in the in I'm gonna drop that to you um soon uh, so mm -hmm. you can access that. Um in fact I can drop it in this private chat right here <laughs> so mm -hmm. right now. Um so yeah, yeah, but yeah, the, the sister is doing some good work. Uh, so we give thanks for that. Um ten thousand years old, kings and queens. We're looking at things ten thousand years old, um, in, as far as Nubia is concerned. Um mm -hmm. I'll ask this one more question just to see if anybody wants to come in the chat. Once again, StreamYard link on the gotcrushtv.com and also, <clears throat> also in the YouTube chat. Um, just to touch on the economics of the, of the Nile Valley for a second, Brother Robin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in relation to um, the, the trading along the Nile, just speak to the evidence of the fact that the people in Kemet, um, uh, and, and I understand that... Um, Queen Taye, Hapshet, so the, a lot of the queens, yeah, were quite central to, to these, these trade links across the Nile Valley, as far as down as Ethiopia, what is now called modern-day Ethiopia, from my understanding. Just, just speak to that a little bit, for the sake of our viewers. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons for the voyages would be to pick up trade goods. So you had um, Hatshepsut's famous voyage to um, the land of Punt, which we think is either Ethiopia or Somalia, to pick up trade goods. Um, other pharaohs have done it before as well. Um, um, the mental hoteps also visited Punt um, mm -hmm. in, in, in earlier time periods. Um, mm -hmm. And basically the River Nile was a very, very important trade center. So the very first central trade in the, the Nile Valley like that was the Nubian Kingdom of Tarseti. We know because of the burials that they had products that were of Egyptian manufacture, they had products that were coming from what they call Syro Palestine. They had products that were coming from Somalia. They had mm -hmm. products that were coming from Central Sudan, and all those mm -hmm. products ended up in the Tarseti graves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the way that they did it was by ship travel. Mm -hmm. So goods moved primarily along the Nile by ship, and then when Egypt became a power, they continued the same idea and that's why you ended up with goods coming in from cyprus goods coming in from the aegean um and all these end up in egyptian burials you understand um, um and so trade along the ancient world another group of people that were very important in the history of trade was phoenicians and the phoenicians is actually even though that's the middle east it is actually black history as well and they were you know, the most advanced shipping in the ancient world yeah. mm -hmm. They were even trading with ancient Britain. So the mm -hmm. tin mines of Cornwall is them. And even European scholars admit that before the, the Atlantic age, um, the, the, the most advanced shipping in the world was them. Yeah. So yeah, they, 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 the, the, the importance of trade is a big, big issue. And, um, and then goods changing hands by with a certain exchange rate of a certain amount of gold equals a certain amount of silver equals a certain amount of copper equals a certain amount of bushels of wheat. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. All right, Brother Robin. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna draw things to a close. We've been on for uh, about three hours and fifteen minutes at this point. It was a, been a fantastic presentation. Some insightful questions have been asked. Um, mm -hmm. and, Give, give thanks, Brother Robin. Thank you for stepping in the breach, you know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> and also being willing to go forward, even though um, we were basically shut down by the government, effectively. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, being willing to do the live event. Um, we appreciate that very, very much. Family, we hope you have enjoyed. Um, do stay tuned for more. Um, look out. Where, where can they stay in touch with you, Brother Robin? Mm -hmm. Where can Sorry, they yeah. stay in touch? 
you? Where can, it, where can they stay in touch with you and your? I'm on Facebook, Facebook innit? it. Okay, this is what I'm doing on Facebook. I'm on Facebook uh, under my name, Robin Walker. And what I've been doing is I've been posting once every day uh, what you can do in terms of educating yourself. You understand? Very simple thing. I've just been posting uh, what TV documentaries you can watch. And it amazes people that there's a whole heap of TV that have been dropping um, um, bombs on black history. Yeah. Things that, you, in other words, things that you wouldn't expect. So things like, so what I've been introducing people to, there's the Miles Davis documentary. Which is on BBC iPlayer right now. Yes. There's mm. Miss World 1970. You know, Miss World 1970, a black woman came first and second. Mm. Yeah. And they interview those two women. There's Fab Five Freddy, the hip hop artist in Florence, going through the, the medieval art of Italy and flagging up the black presence in the art, including things like the, the you know, that one of the three kings is black, yeah. Mm -hmm. and dropping that kind of information so the main thing is I, i've been trying to you know so if people want to hit me up um facebook all right so stay tuned to facebook. you know you you're, you're the other day me to go and watch that miles davis documentary it's a pretty good one i've seen a couple it's of movies. yeah but that that one is a, is a pretty good one and you know what brother Robbie, that I, I i'm not sure if you've done this yet i know you've done stuff on black music in general yeah but i think do a, a more an in-depth one on jazz yeah I know, I know you're a jazz man um for those for those who don't know brother robin is a, literally a jazz man as in a player of instrument uh he was a member of um uh, uh the jazz warriors yeah as as led by um courtney pine courtney pine <laughs> as they've got up my head yeah courtney pine um but but yeah i don't know if you've done anything specifically on jazz have you have you delved into the history of jazz yeah, I, I, I have. And uh, I, I've written a lecture, which I don't know if you guys want to host or someone wants to host, it, you know, putting this out into the universe. I've written a lecture called Louis Armstrong, uh -huh. Civil Rights Hero or Sellout. <laughs> Woo! Okay. So if uh -huh. anyone wants to host that, then yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. All right, well, we'll look into, we'll look into that, Kings and Queens. Maybe if they got Chris, but you know what I'm saying? If somebody wants to get there first, feel free to jump in here on the Black History Man on the Facebook uh, and these things. But yeah, you know, jazz jazz is one of our most important cultural products, family. You know what I'm saying? So I do hope uh, that, we, um, that we appreciate that. <laughs>